Welcome back to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato here in my home studio with my partner in crime and co-conspirator, Scott Bernstein. Hey now. Thanks everyone for tuning in, for watching and listening. Please, if you haven't already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or subscribe to our audio podcast. And uh, please uh, follow us on social media, help spread the word. It's a, it's a big help to, to grow the channel. We have an interesting episode today uh, that connects to some of my research interest and in the Sicilian Mafia, and also it also has to do with uh, John Gotti. So I think a pretty interesting story, and we'll unpack it a little bit, and then you know see what y'all think, um, and see what Scott thinks about it. So where I got this idea from, the the point of departure here was a story broke or was reported a few weeks ago in the Italian press regarding um, Maurizio Avola, who was uh, this prolific hitman for the Santa Paola uh, family in Catania, Sicily. And so he's a pentito. He's basically a snitch, an informant, and he cooperates with authorities to to incarcerate other, other mafiosi. Anyhow, he leaked to the press recently that he had he's claiming that he was in addition to a former mafia hitman that he was also an asset for the italian secret services and i don't i don't really want to unpack that I, I really can't speak to that but seeing his name again in the press reminded me of a, of a story that came out a few years ago and I'm, I'm not sure if people followed this or were aware of this but about five years ago especially the international press picked up these allegations that Alvola was making that John Gotti sent a bomb maker to Sicily in 92 to help with the assassination of um, Giovanni Falcone, the anti-mafia prosecutor. It's just like for people that don't know, I mean, this is like in Europe, this is one of the most infamous, uh, political assassinations of all time. I mean, Jimmy and I were talking off air. It's like when they killed Martin Luther King or JFK or RFK, that's like the level of infamy it has. Yeah. So just, yeah, some, I, I totally agree with that. And, and so some, some background there, Giovanni Falcone was a very popular public figure to, to Scott's point. And he was the most zealous anti-mafia investigator in Sicily. And so as you can imagine that the mafia was, was out to get him, but he was also upsetting people in the ruling class in, in mainstream institutions, because a lot of these institutions, let's be quite honest, were also compromised by the mafia, including the, the government, the Vatican, um, the, you know, multinational corporations. And so he was making a lot of enemies and um, leading up to the assassination, actually, he starts to become isolated more and more and the Italian state reduces his security detail. So the situation here, this is a May 23rd, 1992. Um, he is um, on the expressway with his wife, with his security detail. And this is in Capaci, Sicily. And as they're driving, um, a, um, I believe it was a 500 pound um, TNT explosives go off, kill Falcone and his wife, kill bodyguards and the security detail. And you, you just saw the, the, the picture that that Ben put up there. Um, just a really catastrophic event. And there were like political ripples across the, the country. And, again, because this this guy was a beloved public figure and he was he was a, a true believer i mean he he really believed that the integrity of a, of having a democratic republic in italy was was contingent on rooting out mafia corruption and mafia violence and, and he, he paid the ultimate price for it um but in terms of the italian state cutting back on a security detail uh there was no helicopter surveillance of that area leading up to him driving through there 
And so they didn't notice that earlier in the day there were construction workers fucking around by the expressway. And these were actually mafia guys and they placed 500 pounds of plastic explosives in a large metal pipe. And then, you know, it goes off and, and, and kills everyone. So anyhow, um, Avila claims that he was in on that conspiracy and he told prosecutors, this is a few years ago that he met this, this explosives expert in Catania and that he was told that you've met a very important person, La Americano, right? This a very important American who was connected to the boss, John Gotti. And that in fact, John Gotti sent this bomb maker to, to Sicily to help with this um, project assassination. Um, I'm, I'm calling bullshit on this. So I, I just, I don't, I don't think it's true. And um, I, let's go through a couple of different reasons why um, I don't think it's true. We'll see what Scott thinks and others in the comments. But um, first of all, let's just start with the logistics of, of bomb making. There's no reason for me to believe that the Sicilian mafia would need the help of any American, let alone John Gotti in terms of bomb making um, there, there's, there was a history of bombs and campaigns of terror in Italy. I mean, going back to the 1960s and, and some of that involved the mafia. Some of it was, was more explicitly political. You had like left-wing groups like the red brigades. You had these right-wing neo-fascist groups who were, who were blowing shit up. So there were people in Italy that, that knew about bombs. Um, one of the more tragic examples in terms of, um, you know, the mafia was the, um, 1984 bombing of train 904. This was heading from Naples to Milan. And uh, the mafia placed a bomb on the train. It went off um, December. I think, I believe it was late December around Christmas kills over 16 people, over 200 people wounded. So that's in, in 1984. There's other examples of where they were using bombs to, to assassinate judges, prosecutors, and even subsequently, after the Capacci bombing and assassination of Falcone, there's subsequent bombings uh, in 92, just a, a few months after Falcone is assassinated in, in May. In July, his right hand, Borsellino, who was another staunchly anti-mafia prosecutor in Sicily, he and Falcone were, were really, you know, partners. Well, they just spent the last better half of the last decade locking up right. every major mafiosi uh in in sicily so yeah. you know i'm not excusing it i'm just explaining it why yeah. they were so hated and why it was such top priority for all of them i mean this wasn't like tell me if i'm wrong jimmy yeah this wasn't like one guy deciding to do this like no, one no, mob this, this was like all the mafia time saying this is for the best for our overall business yeah, right. He those two had to go, and 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 I recommend. Um, I'd like to talk more about like books. Um, so I recommend uh, "Excellent Cadavers" by uh, Alexander Stile, um, and also um, "Mafia Republic" by by uh, John Dickey. But if you if you read "Excellent Cadavers," it's it's really um, a Jimmy. Uh, come come closer to the mic, buddy. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, just when you when you go yeah. away, it's. I got gotcha. you. So excellent cadavers. I mean, it's, it's very sad when you're reading, you know, leading up to the bombings of Falcone and Borsellino, because they're basically dead men walking. Um, they know what Scott just was saying. <laughs> like they know that they're being isolated politically um, and that the mafia is out to get them. Falcone famously said, Cosa Nostra never forgets. And um, it, it's a very chilling sequence of events because Borsellino and Falcone are basically fatalistic. They know that it, it's only a matter of time before, before the mafia assassinates them. And they do, they killed Borsellino blew another bombing in July 19th, uh, July 19th, 1992. And then a year later in 1993, a sequence of bombs go off um, another campaign of terror. This was um, spearheaded by Totorina who was also involved in the Falcone and Borsellino uh, assassinations. 
he's he's captured finally in 93 and as a, a you know type of protest a number of bombs go off in um uh, 1993 in milano five people are killed a bomb in um florence they were targeting like uh, art museums art galleries and then some bombs go off in rome and targeting like the some of the basilicas there and you know civilians are wounded now i i now i know chronologically these bombs are after the falcone assassination but i would still argue it it makes this point that there are plenty of people who know about bomb making in sicily in italy that have connections to the mafia and so i just don't see logically how logistically what John Gotti would would have to do with 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 any of this, and then I would also add, and we'll see what Scott thinks. Um, I just, in terms of John Gotti's relationship with the Sicilians, I, I don't see why he would be brought in into this. Um, well, I have an I have an answer for that, but finish. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I I guess my reaction to this is twofold. Um. My first inclination was to call bullshit. Um, and part of that, in addition to what Jimmy laid out, which I agree with, up until the point he just said uh, that he didn't know why the Sicilians would have any connection to Gotti, and I have a theory about that. But besides that, everything that Jimmy said, I agree with. Um, furthermore, look at the timing on this, 1992, 1993, where was John Gotti at this point? Was he on the street? No. Right. Uh, he got taken off the street in December of 1990. Excellent. So he's in, you know, from 90 to 92, he's fighting a case. Uh, I believe he's convicted in, I think it was the summer of 92. I could be wrong. Um, but by late 92, I'm pretty sure he's in the federal system and uh, shipped off to Marion. By 93, he's at he's in Marion, um, which is a very high security federal uh, prison in Illinois. So that whole time period, John Gotti had a lot of other stuff to worry about uh, other than helping out his Sicilian counterparts. Um, he was fighting for, he was literally was fighting for his life. So I question not just logistically, but I question, well, I guess that might play into the logistics. Like he had a lot on his plate at that point. And to Jimmy's point, what, how does it benefit him? Like where, where does he, where's the, the, the return on investment, I guess. Uh, but as I was thinking about it, and this is where I'll open up a sliver of, I guess, potential. I wouldn't say it's good. I wouldn't say it's got a good chance of being true, but I will be open to the possibility um, based on the fact that for people that really know the inside baseball of the Gambinos over the last 40 years, there's really not that much of a divide between the Gotti regime and the Sicilian regime that is in power right now, uh, most of whom came up in the Gotti regime being mentored by Gotti loyalists and lieutenants. Um, so the idea that guys like Dom Sheffalu, Lorenzo Menino, Frankie Boy Cali, Pete Inzerillo, although they were young, the idea that some part of that faction, um, or I guess multiple factions within the Gaudis that are within the Gambinos during the Gaudi regime that had ties to, the, to that Sicilian branch, I suppose it, it could have been put through some of those guys, not necessarily through Gaudi, Jackie, you know, Jackie D'Amico, um, who was a future acting boss and was one of the guys that was assigned to groom a lot of these Sicilians that are now the bosses. 
you know, he, he went to Sicily in the last six months of his life to meet with Sicilian mafia leaders. So I'll just say that because of that connection, I'll leave open a sliver of possibility. But for the most part, I would agree with Jimmy that I it seems a bit far fetched. Yeah, I, I want to spend at least a couple of minutes adding on to that, unpacking this relationship between Gotti and the Sicilians, because to your point, it, it was there and there was a relationship. Um, in fact, I, I know there, there's some other content creators out there, I think, suggesting it was an antagonistic relationship. And I, I don't think that's true at all no. between Gotti and the Sicilians. I don't think Gotti tr trusted the Sicilians, but I don't. And think I, think really there, I think there is. I think there. I think Gene Gotti has, um, I don't want to use the word love hate relationship because I think that overstates the issue. But um, I think there is a world or a, a, a school of thought from Gene, specifically Gene and, and his group of people, that they might have wished that Sicilians weren't in power when he came back and that Gene could have you know, uh, taking a spot in the administration, maybe a boss, uh, maybe he was owed that. I'm, I'm saying that's what yeah. some of the, the thought processes, what processes were. But for the most part, and I just want to add to what we're talking about, and, and I get, in my opinion, adding um, merit, is that Sheffalu, Menino, before that, Frankie Boy Cali, Joe Lonnie, Joe Brooklyn, Pete and Zerillo, these are guys that surround themselves, yes, by other Sicilians, but also by a lot of OG Gotti guys. Yes. Lenny yeah. DiMaria, the Carozo brothers, um, Mickey Boy Paradiso, other, other, I'm sure there are other ones that I'm. So a, a lot of the, a lot of Menino and Sheffalo's sounding boards aren't just other Sicilians. Yeah, there are people that used to be very close and used as sounding boards for Gotti. Yeah, so even if Gotti and his maybe you know some of his siblings personally didn't trust Sicilians, I don't think there's any evidence that they that they had an antagonistic relationship. No. and quite if anything, it's 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 a the opposite. No, he embraced he, now what his motives were. Those that 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 can be debated, but what yeah. what is fact is that he put a lot of these guys that are in power right now back in the eighties when he took, when Gotti himself took power, he took somewhat of an interest in this group of Sicilians and made sure that they were being groomed by people that he trusted um, to eventually have some standing. I don't know if he saw them being, you know, running the family right. 20 years from then, but he definitely wasn't ignoring them and wasn't alienating or isolating them. And so, I mean, if we go back a little bit further with this, with this relationship between Gotti and the Sicilians, I think of right after the assassination, Castellano is related to the Cherry Hill Gambinos. And um, so John Gambino, Rosario. Joseph and Lorenzo Gambino, Menino was brothers. with those guys. Menino yeah, was those, with those guys. Yeah. Frankie Cali, Pete. And Frankie Cali. Well, Frankie Cali was at, well, he might've started with them, but then Frankie Cali ends up, and Jackie D'Amico's group. Yeah, well, that's yeah, that's because John and Joe Gambino go away to prison for like right. a lot of the nineties, and, and right, right. So, um, but um, if, first of all, Gotti, you know, ha wants to meet with John Gambino and just make sure everything's copacetic because he knows that that Paul Castellano is very close with his Zip cousins, specifically the Cherry Hill Gambinos. And then uh, by by eighty seven, I mean, according to FBI surveillance. John Gotti's meeting with John Gambino basically every week. Yeah. And um the 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 way that it was explained to me was one of the earlier meetings specifically talking about to you know when Scott asked what what's the agenda here well it's money that Cherry Hill Gambinos were prolific earners not only with construction and gambling but let's be honest right drugs yeah drugs <laughs> narcotics trafficking who so Gotti can of they can espouse the whole you know, drugs or die or all, but I mean, the, the Gotti guys were just, you know, drowning in coke and heroin. Yeah. I mean, that, that yeah. I mean, not in quite, terms quite, of them quite, doing it, but in terms of no, them. No. Um, so the, the way it was explained to me was 
during one of these early meetings with John Gambino and, and John Gotti about, about specifically narcotics trafficking that Gotti went to John and Gambino and had, had took a, took out a piece of paper and folded it in half and then folded it again and said, this is my, this is my cut. <laughs> so, but this is a great, it's a great story. Yeah, great visual, right? <laughs> a great visual, right, of the, of the drug trade. So now we also know, however, from the, you know, when the FBI bugged uh, Gotti's, um, that apartment, that, you know, privately, yes, he didn't trust the Sicilians. There's, there's some of that is in there. He's, he's concerned that, that they're, they're holding out on him, that they're, they're making money and not, you know, not sharing with them. Uh, it kind of annoys him that some of them don't speak English. Um, so there, there, there's some some of that in there. But in general, I think they had a... Um, he knew what happened a, to Galante. A good working knew, relationship with each he other. He knew what happened to Galante. He knew what happened to Angelo Bruno. He was very aware of those things. Yeah. So. I, I think he made it work. So, um, and we, we also know on the um, other side, though, that the Sicilians... There's some information that that has come out from Rosario Namo, who um, I think is a, a better source than Avola. He says the Sicilian mafia guys didn't like John Gotti. So, um, it, it's, I don't think I, they just. I don't. I don't think it was. I, I'm not. I can't speak to what exactly they were thinking, but yeah, just from my and, I, and Jimmy, you've studied the Sicilians way more than I have. Wouldn't you? chalk some of that up to just like they're just not going to like any american guys that they have to well especially i mean part of it was they they said john Gotti. they they and we're talking about not the cherry hill gambinos but the guys actually in sicily that that they were sort of mystified by they said what is what does he think he's an actor like john (laughs) guy right he's like uh you know he wants to be on the cover of time magazine yeah right like that's not how things roll in palermo and corleone and places like that so i I about in detroit (laughs) <laughs> yeah, even right. So I, I think that rubbed them the wrong way. Um, so even though Gotti had these connections, especially to, you know, working positive working relationship with the Cherry Hill Gambinos um, for these other reasons, I still don't think the Sicilians would have to go to him for a bomb maker logistically to Scott's point. Gotti is not even, you know, he's got bigger problems at the time. I'm not sure the guys in Sicily would have trusted him even you know, liked him in the, it, to begin with. So I'm not buying it. And didn't um, we also say, I don't know. We, I don't remember if we said this off air, or if we said this on air. So I apologize if I'm being redundant, but yes, there have been some exceptions, but for the most part, the five families, when it comes to New York mafia, they're not blowing people up. That is a, <laughs> that is a Youngstown, Cleveland, yeah. like Pittsburgh, St. Louis yes. thing. Right. That's, Great that's point. not, Right. That's not a, a a trademark of the. So, again, I'm not saying there aren't explosive experts that you could find in the five families, but it's not. It's not like this was a um, a calling card. No, I mean, the Chico, that was a, a notable exception, but I think it's the exception that proves the rule. I mean, one of the reasons why that was so striking was New York usually doesn't do. And they wanted to make it like look that. like it wasn't them. And, you know, with them. <laughs> That's right. 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 It's not the same thing, but like with um, um, Phil Testa, they blew him up, but it was made to look like it had come from the roofers union, yeah, which the was Irish. the Irish mafia, when in fact it was coming from his own people. Yeah. So I don't think if you were in Sicily and you wanted to assassinate a, a magistrate, I don't I don't think your instincts would be to go to go to New York. So and in, then in a couple of other things. I feel like in 92, yeah, right. you'd almost have been better reaching out to Joe Messino at that point. Yeah. Um, I, I just think there were, there were too many guys in Italy that knew about this again, from the, these other campaigns of terror and even the mafia's own history of, of, of bomb making. Um, and uh, just another thing about uh, Maurizio um, Avola. He's also made some other sensationalistic claims, not only that he was, a secret service asset uh, in Italy, but that the mafia in Sicily was going to assassinate Mario Cuomo during one of his visits to Sicily. That actually made the, the, that actually made the American press when he, when he made that allegation that I'm, I'm not sure I buy that either. I don't, I don't, I don't see why I just don't, why, 
Like, um, so my point is Avila has made some of these claims in the past that I don't know if he's trying to get attention or whatever, but I'm not buying it, but I do think it's interesting. It it gives us, um, a chance to talk about, yeah, it's an interesting story. It's cool that you have these two kind of pretty iconic figures, maybe from different sides of the ocean, Falcone and Gotti, and you never really heard them mentioned in the same, right you know, breath or same category. So now that we're hearing it, whether or not it's true or not, again, we're debating it, but it's interesting to talk about. And the last thing I'll say, and I think this encapsulates a lot of the narrative that we're putting out there, which I believe is 100% accurate, was the Gaudis did not resist um, the, the changeover in eras. Uh, Junior walked away. Peter was locked up. Gene wasn't coming home for another decade. And, it, you know, Sheffaloo and, and those guys, it, I don't think it was a, a, a controversial decision. I don't think it, there was any acrimony. It was just like, yeah, this is the new era. These are the new guys. And as a result, most of, if not all of the Gotti camp has been embraced in this era. They haven't been alienated. Yeah. And by the way, those guys, like the Cherry Hill Gambino guys that we're talking about, don't don't forget, like, they were on the outs with Toto Reina and the, yeah. the guys who were organizing the assassination of Borsellino and Falcone. Like, I mean, John Gambino specifically had a had a working relationship with them and they they respected him and he was the kind of like the liaison. But in Zerillo, remember those those guys are all hiding out in the United States and, yeah. and in South America, the Caribbean, because Totorina said, "I'm going to kill them if any of them, any of them step foot in 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 Sicily or Italy," and so um, I just think they had a very complicated relationship. I think they were willing to sell drugs together, <laughs> but um, beyond that, I, I don't see the Corleonese entrusting something like this with with you know Gotti or the or the Sicilian Gambinos, Ch- and then plus, tell- you know, for the other reasons that we've outlined as well. As we wrap up here, shameless self-promotion for both Jimmy and I. I'm surprised we didn't bring this up earlier. Me and the doctor back in, I think it was 19, 2019, we were uh, hired consultants by Sony Classic Pictures to be uh, historical producer consultants, fact checkers for a movie uh, that was put out uh, in Italy about this case, about Falcone. And uh, it was done, uh, directed by the, by the guy they claim is the, the Scorsese of, of, uh, of Europe. And uh, it, it was well-received uh, over there, and, and we're both uh, pretty proud of our work on it. Um, Il Trattore, so, yeah. Yeah, um, the traitor. And um, uh, Pier Francesco Favino plays uh, Tommaso Buscetta in that. And uh, the, the only reason why I bring that up is because Favino, one of my favorite actors of all time. Why? Because he played Don Feligi Bucciolato, <laughs> the youngest godfather. It's all the bloodline. <laughs> the youngest godfather, if you've ever seen that film, with uh, uh, Martin Landau, Martin Landau. plays Joe, yeah. Joe Bonanno. And uh, th- that's a good cast. Ed- Edward James almost plays Salvatore Maranzano. And uh, anyhow, uh, Favino plays Feligi Bucciolato. So those are my favorite scenes in the film, as, as you can imagine, when the Bucciolatos are in there. So, but anyhow, it's interesting. Uh, obviously, I like to study what's going on in Sicily. It gives me an excuse to talk about it. And um, so anyhow, we hope that you found this interesting and informative. Again, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe. Please follow. And uh, I'm Jimmy Bucciolato. Scott Bernstein. And we're out.